Okay, in the last two videos, we talked about TCP, the handshake and congestion control, and how TCP is going to help us have reliable transport, and how it's going to help us utilize the maximum bandwidth that's available on the network by, you know, keeping track of when we drop packets and how many packets are coming back and forth and when packets are being acknowledged. And in this video, we're going to talk about what happens after the TCP handshake occurs. What kind of data are we going to start sending? So in the overarching question, remember, we're trying to figure out what happens when I type www.google.com into my browser's URL bar, you know, and all the work that goes into facilitating this exchange of, you know, HTML, essentially, to serve me Google's homepage. And the thing that happens after the TCP handshake depends on whether or not this is an HTTP connection or an HTTPS connection. So in the olden days, we didn't have much of a need for encryption or security, or maybe we had a need and we were just naive about that need, depending on who you ask. But anyway, the point is, we have protocols available both for unencrypted regular HTTP data and encrypted HTTPS data. In this video, I'm assuming that we're good, you know, citizens of the internet and using encryption when we make our web requests. So we're going to be talking about HTTPS. If we were just using HTTP, the next thing that would happen is we'd start sending HTTP data back and forth to Google and get the actual data of the homepage, the HTML, the JavaScript, the CSS. But with HTTPS, what we need to do before we can transmit any of that data is actually secure the connection. And you know, this is uh, a challenging problem, more challenging problem than many people might think because Google and I have to, across this internet, this open public communication channel, where anybody could be looking in or spying at any time, you know, let's say Trudy the intruder here is watching our connection. This is Trudy. If Trudy's watching our connection, Google and I have to be able to tell each other a secret or find a way to keep something secret, even though Trudy might be able to see every single request that, that we make. And this is very tricky to do, but we do have a protocol that we have good reason to believe prevents Trudy from being able to sniff on our encrypted traffic. And this is called TLS, Transport Layer Security. It used to be called SSL, Secure Socket Layer. TLS replaced SSL, okay? Even though they're, they're really just extensions of the same same protocol. TLS is like a, the newest version of SSL, and SSL is a deprecated term. Anyway, so how does TLS work, and what does it do in order to ensure that Trudy can't see what we're communicating about? That's what this video is about. So prior to this, we've done our TCP handshake. We've sent, you know, the three-way handshake, SYN, SYNAC, ACK. And we've established that we're going to be communicating with TCP, and that's going to manage our speed and everything like that. And the first packet of data we send, if you remember back two videos ago, ago I said, when we send the final part of the three-way handshake, I'll do this in a different color. When we send the final part of the three-way handshake, the ACK final act of the handshake, we can also piggyback some data. And the first piece of data that we send is actually the first piece of the TLS handshake. Okay, so now me and Google are communicating in HTTP, we would have sent an HTTP request. In HTTPS, we're going to be sending the first byte of the TLS handshake, which is something called the Cypher Suite negotiation. The first two requests are part of Cypher Suite negotiation. So I send to Google, and you know, by me, I mean 
my web browser is the thing making this choice. So Google's Google Chrome probably is saying, or maybe, you know, Firefox or Brave, I shouldn't be so presumptuous, is saying, hey, here are a list of ciphers that I'm willing to use. AES is a common choice. Um, there's other ciphers too, though, like Blowfish is an example and a bunch of others. I'll, I'll link a few in the extended resources. So I say, here's a symmetric encryption key that I'd like to use, or a symmetric encryption cipher that I'd like to use, AES, for example. And I have to also provide a cryptographic hash function, one of the SHA families, SHA2 or SHA3 or something like that is a really common choice there, but there are other ones as well. MD5 is one you should not use, it's been broken, but it's an example of another cryptographic hash function. Okay, and I send a list of all the protocols that I'm willing to use, as well as a, a value called a nunce, which is a unique random value that should only be used once for this particular connection. Okay, so I send a list of ciphers that I'm willing to use, and Google sends back, says, okay, you said you could use AES and Blowfish, I chose AES, and you said you could use SHA-1 or SHA-2, I chose SHA-1. So it sends back in response to this, a cipher suite as well. And it says, yep, okay, check, I'll use AES, check, I'll use SHA-2. So these first two messages are called the Cypher suite negotiation, okay? And it includes picking, crucially picking, a symmetric cipher, as well as a cryptographic hash function. Okay, once I've received, for, oh, there's one more important thing. Google, along with their choice of AES and SHA-2, in our case, their choice of cipher suite, they also send something called their certificate. Okay. And a certificate has two purposes. One is the certificate has been signed by uh, an authority. And so there are people who, well, organizations really, that whole job is to create these certificates and sign them using cryptographic signatures to ensure that this server is who they say they are. So VeriSign is maybe the most well-known of the certificate authorities, CA, certificate authority. And they sign cryptographic um, certificates, which allow us, when we receive that certificate, to verify that VeriSign signed that certificate. And this certificate crucially contains something called Google's public key. Okay. And Google's public key is a public key for the RSA public key encryption suite um, cipher. So they send us a RSA public key, which we can then use to send Google information that nobody else can read, but that only Google can read. And I'll, I'll provide a link about public key encryption in the extended resources as well. So using this certificate, I have verified that VeriSign believes that this server that I'm talking to is in fact Google. And I have a key that I can use to send them a message that only they can read. So that's good for us. Now I can start communicating privately. But crucially, Google's server has not got a way to ensure that what I'm sending to them came exclusively from me. I can send messages using Google's public key that Trudy can't read or interpret, but Google can't guarantee that that's me. So the next step is to, you know, help Google and me communicate so that both sides of the connection are private. And you might think, you know, maybe I should just have a public key and send it to Google. There are a few reasons why that's not what happens. One of them is speed, but Anyway, I'll link something in the resources about that too. So I get this certificate, I extract Google's public key from the certificate, and I create something called the pre-master secret. And this choice of the pre-master secret, this is, you know, a 
basically a bunch of randomly generated data, cryptographic random generated data that will allow us to generate a key for this symmetric encryption cipher and a key for this hash function. And we'll use those two keys and this symmetric cipher and this hash function to communicate privately after we've exchanged the pre-master secret. Okay, so I take this pre-master secret and I use Google's public key to encrypt the pre-master secret using RSA and I send the pre-master secret to Google. Then simultaneously, now that Google has the pre-master secret and I have the pre-master secret, both Google and I begin to generate something called the master secret. And this master secret is deterministically generated based on the pre-master secret, okay, master secret. So we both generate a master secret and this master secret contains four values, a client symmetric encryption algorithm key, encryption key, a server encryption key, a client MAC code, that stands for message authentication code, and a server not secret, okay? So we generate all four of these values and the rest of the time after this, once these four values have been generated as the master secret on both sides, anytime I send a message to Google, I will encrypt it using my client encryption key, okay? So that's like, I have a message, here's my message, I run that message through, we chose A, B, S, and I use the client encryption key also as input to AES, my client key, and out comes an encrypted message. I take that encrypted message and I run it through a hash function, we chose SHA-2 in this case, okay. And the client MAC secret is also input. Client secret is also input to SHA-2. Out of this comes something called a hash code or a MAC, message authentication code. And that MAC is appended to my encrypted data. Okay, then the thing that I transmit over the wire to Google is this whole thing, this encrypted value plus the MAC code. And this allows them to ensure that <clears throat> the encrypted data I sent is indeed the encrypted data that they received using the MAC as a checksum. And they can decrypt the encrypted message itself using the client encryption key. So this way, Google and I can both determine messages that are being sent are indeed the ones that I created and no one else can read them without having the master secret, the client key. Okay, so this is the way we use the values in the master secret to generate messages that travel back and forth safely and you know, privately. And the next thing we do is now that we've generated all of this data, we've generated the master secret, we now take all the messages that have been exchanged up until now and we hash their data and we exchange in an encrypted fashion, we both send to each other, A hash 
of all the data that's been transmitted so far. And we do that using the encryption strategy that I just described. So we receive the hash of all the messages we've received so far. We verify them using the map secrets and SHA. We then decrypt them using the encryption keys. And we verify that those hash values are the same, which means that all the messages that I've sent haven't been tampered with on the way over. And all the messages that Google sent haven't been tampered with on the way over, meaning, you know, we both have an identical record of the communication that's happened so far. And this is to prevent man in the middle attacks from say, intercepting the pre-master secret and exchanging it for a different pre-master secret or intercepting the cipher sweep and exchanging it for a different cipher sweep negotiation period. So we exchange those hashes and if they match, then we're done. And we just continue communicating in an encrypted fashion and we'll begin to transfer back and forth actual HTTP data now that we've established a way to get the secure part of HTTPS. And if any moment in here, something breaks, you know, like if these hash codes don't match, for example, then we just abandon the connection. We assume something's wrong. Someone's hijacking our connection in the middle and we might try and reestablish, start over from scratch until we can get hashes that do indeed match. Okay, cool, so that's TLS. Well, it's the TLS answer.